Cayman has experience from being a uh, global trading experience with major banks. So he wasn't inside the Fed like you were, Joseph, but you know, he sees, uh, saw a lot of the machinations that take place. So uh, why don't we start off with uh, what we saw in the markets Friday, that there was a little, we talked about uh, last week uh, that you thought they're getting close to where rates were gonna stop going higher. And the 10 year did that, but the 30 year, really didn't have hardly any recovery, like the shorter term durations. It made me think of you, is it possible that now during this pause that the yield curve moves from being inverted to begin to steepen a bit here? I think that's very likely, but so I think there's two ways that I look at this. So one, how things would play out if nothing were to intervene and how I think things might actually have to play out. So a few months ago, I was thinking that the U-curve would steepen because simply based on supply and demand dynamics, I think of longer dated rates as mostly just supply and demand. And if you looked at the supply and demand dynamics, it was really clear that longer dated rates would have to go higher and potentially much higher. Now. I'll just go through those dynamics really quickly. So on the supply side, uh, well, as we all know, um, the US Treasury just issues lots of debt. The US government runs perpetual deficits. But what we don't, what you may not be clear about is that the level of those deficits has basically jumped up much higher than before. So pre-COVID every year, we were issuing about $500 billion in US Treasuries. Post-COVID now, we're estimating, based on government numbers, based on what's already on the books, about a trillion a year, basically forever. And you add on top of that QT, so that's an extra few hundred billion as well. So th there's really no way you can issue, let's say, $1.5 trillion in U.S. Treasuries a year and not expect, uh, let's say, the price to go down, which is to say yields go higher. Now, you add that to the de de demand dynamics. Um, the demand dynamics are that the, ma the major marginal buyers in treasuries, the Fed and the commercial banks, they're no longer buying. Uh, you can actually see that very clearly in the official data. Fed was buying you know, tens of billions every month. They're not doing that. Commercial banks were buying a lot. They're not doing that. So you have this air pocket now where you have tremendous increase in supply and a changing marginal buyer. So you're gonna have to have yields go higher, um, a phase of price discovery to get there. And we've seen that kind of playing out slowly over the past few few months. A two year was, I mean, 10 year was, you know, let's say two, 3% a few months ago. Now it's comfortably above four and it looks like it wants to go higher. So you I did think, say, Joseph, uh, four and a half percent by year end, four to four and a half percent. And that was six months ago. Great call on the, on the rate move. That was excellent. Because I, yes, I that, didn't that, see that was four a, and a half that, coming. <laughs> that was a really good call. I don't get every, I don't get uh, everything right, but that was a good one. <laughs> Even you liked it. Oh, okay, so uh, um, but uh, go ahead. Uh, um, so that's how I think things would would play out. And as as you noted, Dale, we could get a steepening by the long it continuing to go higher, or eventually we could have the Fed cut rates, and that could seep in it as well. But what what I think though that's probably more likely is that eventually as yields go higher, we're going to have some financial stability issues, maybe not necessarily in the U.S., but maybe abroad. And that will force the authorities to step in and maybe cap or at least slow down that rise. So that's kind of what I'm looking for going forward. And I'll tell you why that I expect the authorities to step in eventually. So when we see yields go higher, we think of it in price, but there's a quantity aspect to, the, to that as well. That is to say, someone who, somewhere who's holding these, so in quote unquote, safe assets, um, they're losing money. So when you have the 10 year go from two and a half percent to four and a half percent, that's a tremendous decline in price. And for some people, they might be holding these as uh, you know, part of a levered portfolio, or they might be getting margin calls and they have to sell. And so you're basically sucking money out of the financial system, and you don't really know at what point things start to get a bit hairy. We saw that happen in the UK just just right. a couple of weeks ago. The UK pension funds they were losing a lot of money from these from from declines in uh, price of gilts. Eventually, they had to sell, which 
prompted further declines in the price of gilts, and eventually people got margin calls, and right. everything was a mess, and the UK government had to step in. The Bank of England had to step in. That's I think, is happening uh, not just in the pension funds, but I think it's happening in a lot of places throughout the world. Eventually, you're going to get to a point where the losses get so big, um, someone's going to puke, uh, causes disorder in the market, and the authorities have to step in. I'm just not sure it's in the U.S. first. I would guess it's probably in the ECB or some ECB first. Uh, you have um, over the past few years, basically, the ECB has been buying all the Spanish and Italian government debt. Now they're right. stepping back a little bit. I think those yields will probably go higher. The banks there, the pension funds there, they might be in some distress as well. And so when you have um, distress in the markets, it's very likely the central banks step in and they basically put a floor on the price of sovereign debt. And I think that will prevent significant steepening from, from playing out, at least in a okay. bare steepening sense. And that's kind of what I look at uh, for the catalyst for the big moves um, in the currency markets and in the equity markets. Okay. I have one more question before I turn it over to K-Man. Uh, I was hoping maybe you could explain it to me. I could show you the picture, but is there any reason why junk bond, if you look at HYG, the ETF for junk, is holding up better and has a stronger structure, not making new lows with the sovereigns, with the you know 30-year bond, 20, whatever the duration is, um, that they were never considered the flight to quality and they're acting better than what used to be considered the flight to quality. Does this qualify for a sovereign debt crisis? Joseph, when people uh, will I, buy I, junk instead of treasuries? I think, we, I, I do definitely think we're on track to, for a sovereign debt crisis. Uh, I, on this in particular uh, asset, I mean, it's possible, but I think something else to keep in mind is that the high yield stuff, it's shorter in duration. So usually, so it's, so it's shorter in duration. So when you have the 10 year, third year go higher, it's impacting this a bit less. I see. Um, okay. So we've kind of priced out, let's say, Fed hawkishness has been, you know, priced up to, let's say, 5%, and it came in uh, on Friday a little bit after Nick Timoreo's article, as you suggested. So so the, it could be just, uh, you know, the the path of Fed funds has basically been max priced in, so it's not impacting this medium duration asset like junk. Um, another right. thing to think about, though, is 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 when the time comes when we do have a lot of concern about sovereign debt. Uh, it, it might actually go to something like Apple or equities, for example. Equities, at the end of the day, you have cash flows that uh, increase with inflation, whereas um, junk debt, even though it's higher yielding, it's ultimately fixed income. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, corporate America is in better shape to deal with this than the federal government, municipalities, uh, bond uh, bond issuers. Although the corporate debt part of this, don't you believe is going to be difficult when they have to roll debt with rates, um, especially for weaker balance sheets that we could be looking at solvency issues next year for a lot of corporations that do a lot of corporate borrowing? Absolutely, absolutely. I think there's a couple points though that to note and, and because of these points i'm a little bit less bearish on that uh the first is that during the past two years when interest rates were really low a whole bunch of people refinanced and they refinanced it they kind of pushed pushed the maturity wall back a few years so we're, we're probably not going to hit that until a few years later so it's not something that would they won't have to roll over uh for for some time okay and interesting. by that and the second thing is that we are in an inflationary period. So we have people uh, earning wages that go up, let's say six and a half percent a year. Corporate revenue is also going to go up because of that, because prices of everything are going higher, right? Maybe their margins will narrow a bit, but their revenues will continue to grow. And if you have an inflationary environment, um, you know, higher revenues, maybe you're more able to pay down interest rate expenses as well. Okay. Uh, K Man? Yes, I'm hi there. Introduce you uh, to Joseph Wang. Joseph Wang, K Man. Hey, hi, Joseph. Um, yeah, I've been a market maker for in, in FX for most of my, uh, my career in uh, um, the major banks um, and in, in that quality. And I uh, was an FX uh, chief dealer for a while. Um, 
I met a lot of uh, central bankers from uh, around the globe while in office. So they had to follow a, a certain uh, a certain line, you know, a verbal verbal line. So now I'm uh, very grateful to be able to talk to you, and hopefully you don't have to you don't have to uh, restrict yourself to uh, official comments anymore. So we can talk about uh, about stuff a bit uh, a bit more openly. No, but. Actually, you front ran already a lot of the the questions I had for you and 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 uh, and things. But I want to and and I think it's it's important for a, a fair part of our audience to to understand. Um, so we have we have had those pandemic years um, where there was like an, an accelerated uh, injection of uh, liquidity, really really huge huge huge. Um, and I think uh, this, they didn't have enough punch balls to put the, 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 the amount of money in. And now with the, the, hiking of the hiking of the rates, but then the addition of QT, that punch ball is gradually um, getting emptied uh, a little bit. And can you just explain uh, what QT adds to on top of the, uh, the, the hiking of uh, yields? I think it might be uh, interesting for our audience to know. First of all, it's a pleasure to meet you, Cayman. I think being a major market banker in the bank, you are in the center of the financial system. You definitely learn a lot, see a lot. So I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts as well later on. Okay. Um, I think when it comes to QT, uh, the funny thing is if you ask the Fed, they'll tell you, uh, you know, I, this and this, uh, we have this model, but we don't really know what works. And if you listen to, let's say, Governor Walla, for example, he'll tell you something like, oh, we can do $2 trillion of QT. Yeah, that's equivalent to 50 basis points in rate hikes. And I'm pretty sure that's complete nonsense. Yeah. So QT does on a high level two things. Um, there's the increasing the supply of treasuries that uh, I discussed with Dale just a moment ago. And there's also the withdrawing the liquidity aspect, as you're hinting at right now. So at a very high level, if you remember, during quantitative easing, the Fed created money out of thin air and used that to buy treasuries. So what that means is someone somewhere in the financial system sold treasuries to the Fed and now has more cash. Now, the way that QE worked, in my view, is that when you have cash, it's really not exactly the same as a treasury. There's not perfect substitutes. For example, um, if I had uh, $100 million in treasuries, I sold that to the Fed, and now I have $100 million on deposit at a bank. It's not the same from two key, re from two key attributes. Um, the first is that cash has zero yield. Um, you know, If you have a checking account, you're not getting anything. Treasuries have a little bit of yield. And the second, which is, I think, a little bit more important, is that treasuries have no credit risk. But if you have a $100 million deposit at a bank, you have credit risk. And if you are a large global asset manager, both attributes are unacceptable to you. You need a little bit of yield, and you definitely, definitely can't take enormous amounts of bank credit risk. So what that what that forces someone to do is that it forces someone to either uh, reach for more yield or reach for more safe assets. You could get more yield by maybe going to a you know triple A rated corporate. You could get more yield by maybe reaching further along the curve, uh, going to a thirty year treasury or something like that. And basically, this whole rebalancing mechanism where you try to get out of cash just to get a little bit more yield, a little bit more safety, um, is ultimately how uh, the, how QE is risk positive for um, for assets. Because let's say you go and you buy an Apple bond. Well, then Apple looks at this. They issue a whole bunch of bonds and they use that to buy back stock. And you see that they've been doing that uh, in size the past few yeah. years. So in my view, that's how the whole mechanism works. And QT unwinds that. So. Mm -hmm someone somewhere had cash now they could have treasuries not just the treasury mind you look at what the treasury yields are right now mm -hmm. two year four and a half percent ten year looks like it's going to four and a half percent now so that fundamentally reverses the whole rebalancing mechanism and when you do that i, I think the logical thing is you know qe makes makes risk access go to the moon qt reverses report for the rebalancing and makes uh makes people I guess, sell risk assets. And I think we've seen that for the past few months. And I'm not super bearish here right now, but I think that's the mechanism, how it works. Uh, just one more detail. Now, the where Fed takes money out of the system also matters. Um, 
Fed can take money out of the banking system or it could take money out of the reverse repo facility, uh, which is, I think of as just extra money in the financial system. We have about $2 trillion of that just sitting there right now. Um, so far, it hasn't really been draining the RRP. So far, it's been draining the banking system. So basically money people hold in banks. I, I think of that as being more impactful. Um, and then until that reverses, I think that that's uh, if it were to reverse, I think it would be more risk asset neutral. Mm -hmm. By reverse, I mean money coming out of the reverse repo facility rather than the banking system. That's called <laughs> net sales, right, Joseph? So our audience knows that, you know, the system repos is adding, match sales is draining. Um, so it, there, there's two ways that the Fed interacts with the uh, with the repo system. There's the repo and there's the reverse repo. Uh, the repo is adding liquidity into the system. The reverse okay. repo was taking liquidity out of the system. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, a, a repo transaction is just um, it's it's just a secured loan against treasury securities. So for example, if I own $100 million in treasury securities and I want to do a repo, what I do is I give my $100 million in treasury securities to someone for usually an overnight loan of $100 million. And that transaction usually unwinds the next day. That's doing repo. I'm borrowing my, uh, collateral out, money in. And reverse repo would just be the other side of that transaction. So let's say I have $100 million in cash and I'm lending that cash because I want a, some extra return, um, but I'm lending it in a, against treasury collateral, which I take in. So it's super safe. There's really no risk in case the guy I lend money to doesn't pay me back. I just right. take the treasury securities and I, and I sell them. So it's, 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 it's what, um, if you have a lot of money and you want to just make a little bit of interest and you were very risk averse, you would just lend and repo. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, and then um, moving on to that, to, to debt. And, and um, I've also been uh, reading, uh, I've been following you for quite a while now, and I've been reading your, your Twitter account. I've been reading your, your articles and, and, and listening to some of your interviews. And um, I, I want to touch a little bit on, on, on debt because, Every now and then, the, the 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 people getting worried about the debt situation everywhere. Um, but we have seen in 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 Japan, they should have been worried 20, 30 years ago. But then their form or their way of doing MMTs uh, and 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 the fact that they that they own most of their uh, of their own debt is 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 probably uh, diminishing that uh, that impact or the worry around it. But in in dollar debt and and I'm more uh, inclined to to ask about the non US detained dollar debt the foreign dollar debt by hiking those rates by doing QT um for those who who thought the party was going to go on and on is there a risk now for instance we've we've seen a lot of countries we've seen a lot of uh, even corporates non 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 us corporates adding to massively to dollar debt during the during the pandemic because um, i mean money was for free um what is your expectation that is going to happen now um, and do we need to get a little bit worried here or have people managed to cover uh, a fair bit of it uh, of their outstandings now that rates are flying yeah so you're 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 thinking about the U.S. dollar denominated debt outside of the U.S. M more, mostly, yeah. I mean, okay, I'm... okay. Well, I think I'll think about. Okay, so there's three parts to this, and I think the U.S. dollar dollar debt is definitely something that's super important. But there's three parts to this, and I think only one part is concerning to me. The three parts are the public U.S. dollar debt, that is Treasuries. The second part is that the private U.S. dollar denominated debt, but of within the U.S., U.S. corporations. And the third part is U.S. dollar denominated debt outside, issued by foreigners. Now, the first part, as, you, as we've discussed, that the U.S. government is basically borrowing trillions a year. And that obviously is not sustainable. Um, but the thing is, okay, it, it's not sustainable in the sense that, uh, actually, I'll take that back. It is sustainable indefinitely. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but let me let me be, be clear a little bit. It's yeah. sustainable indefinitely because you have a money printer, right? So yeah. you're like Japan. 
You can basically issue gazillion dollars every day. That's okay. At the end of the day, you could have the Fed buy it. So it's really not, there's really no limit to this at all. It can do this wherever. Uh, the constraint has to do with inflation. And that's why it's not sustainable. Because if you're just, you know, basically printing and spending every day uh, in size, uh, eventually you're going to get a lot of inflation. And that's going to cause lots of political problems. And that's going to force you to cut back. And that's kind of what we see right now today. It's not forcing a cutback in spending, but it's forcing a hike in interest rates. Um, so but of course, spending is also a problem as well. So until we, until I see that we have really turned the corner on that, and I don't think we will, I expect inflation is probably going to be elevated going forward. So I, I so just to recap, because the U.S. government has a money printer, uh, we should really never worry about uh, our debt burdens other than for inflation. Now, for the private sector, U.S. dollars now money debt. As we also know, the corporations have issued tremendous amounts of U.S. dollar demonimated debt over the past few years to take care, to take advantage of low interest rates, as you noted, came in, and they've been using that debt, you know, basically to buy back stock, and that's kind of made yeah. the stock market go high. <laughs> they have a margin uh, account now, don't they, Joseph? Really, they borrowed money to buy their stock, which has depreciated many of their stocks, right? So actually, they have a margin account because it's on borrowed money. Oh yeah, you know what? That's right. <laughs> right like, where's, where's, the, where's the average? Where's the, average? the floating yeah. rate? Uh, they're paying more for the loan, uh, you know, uh, on a depreciating asset. Mm, yeah, you, you have to but, you have to know where where the where the average is though, where they started to buy, and uh, yeah, you know. Right. Yeah. So where's the margin? Uh, and if you translate it to to uh, to the to the S and P, is it? Uh, 3,200, 3,200 maybe, uh, and that's a, that's a yeah. number we like to uh, to talk about. But yeah, we were talking about that, uh, please. Yeah, yeah. This, it's funny though. I mean, uh, when their stock goes lower, they, they actually want to buy more because, you know, that's how management gets their bonus. Management is paid in stock. So they have an incentive to to buy back their stock when stock prices go lower. Um, so that, that, so that did I, I like I mentioned earlier, I, I'm less worried about so far because a lot of that matures, you know, in a few years they pushed forward the maturity wall and uh, they managed to borrow when interest rates were very low. Mm. Now, if you're borrowing, let's say in 2020 when interest rates were on zero and now inflation's at eight percent, you know, that's a really good trade. I borrowed at let's say very low rates and my revenues are going higher because of inflation. So uh, that's been a good trade so far. The problem is when they have to go renew that debt, refinance it in a few years. And so that that's something in the future though, but definitely mm. worth watching. Now, the last part is part that I think that, that we should be concerned about. And I think K-Man, you were hinting on this is about the, let's say the foreign corporations, let's say in Mexico and China or uh, just now uh, in the emerging markets who borrowed a lot of, U.S. dollars nominated debt. I think it's helpful to think about also why they do that. So globally, um, the U.S. dollar is the currency of international trade. Um, about half of global trade is invoiced in dollars. So if you're like, say, a Polish company selling something to a, a company in Korea, you know, oftentimes you're going to be paying and receiving in dollars. So because everyone who deals in international trade needs dollars, so they go and they borrow in dollars. That's one part. The other part is you know, dollar interest rates for the past 10 years have, have been relatively low. Um, if you're, let's say, looking at Brazil or you're looking at Mexico, where interest rates there have been much higher than they have been in the US. So it makes sense. You get to have a currency that's more widely used in the world and you get to pay interest rates that are low. So it's, you know, it's an easy, it's a good trade. Um, the problem is that, uh, well, what if dollar interest rates go higher and what if a dollar strengthens? Now, if you're, okay, let's just follow the example. Let's say you're a Mexican corporation well, or Brazilian corporation with U.S. dollar to dominate debt, U.S. dollar debt, then when the U.S. debt is suddenly worth a lot more in, in let's say, local currency terms. It's like you borrowed $100 million and suddenly it's now $150 million. Now think about, let's say, if you were a Japanese company, you borrowed in dollars. Your yen has basically depreciated by 50%. And now your dollar debt in yen terms is worth a lot more. So it's like borrowing something and your debt just gets bigger. That's mm -hmm. that's a solvency issue. And the second, of course, is the interest rate issue. 
Whereas if you borrowed and your rates were floating and now, you know, they're, they're going much higher. Um, that, that's problematic for both the corporations and for also the foreign banks. The corporations, because obviously, you know, maybe, okay, well, it really depends on the corporations. Oftentimes when you have a corporation borrowing dollars, they also, it's because they have revenues in dollars as well. Mm -hmm. You're a company engaged in international trade. You're hedging yourself. You have um, costs in dollars and you have revenues in dollars. So it, it's not necessarily bad. I think on it's not perfectly hedged, of course, so that's why it's not good. But you have to keep in mind that some of it is going to be hedged by their revenues, which are probably in dollars as well. Um, it's so, usually, yes. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, the second part has to do with the banking system. And in the past, it was concerning because if you have um, a foreign bank, a bank in Brazil, or a bank in Mexico, who has, let's say, dollar loans and dollar, <clears throat> and dollar deposits, and suddenly you have a dollar liquidity issue, well, you can't go to the Bank of Mexico, you can't go, into, can't go to the Bank of Brazil because you know they don't print dollars. And so you could have some serious disorder in the emerging markets because you, 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 they're not able to print dollars. Now, that was the problem of the past. I say it's a problem of the past because today the Fed has something called the FX swap lines, which yeah. is basically acting as lender of last resort to the global dollar system. Now, they actually have that basically on all the time now. So that means that if there's a bank, it's not open to everyone to be clear, but if you are a major economy, mm -hmm. uh, let's say you're a Eurozone, and your bank suddenly need dollars, then you can always go to borrow from the Fed. So, so that's, that's what's why. happening at Credit Suisse right now, Joseph? And the SNB? And the SNB I, 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 no? I, I don't actually think that's what's happening there. But oh, we'll right. get into that in just oh, a moment. Okay. Um, but so, so when we look at these, um, so the third section of the dollar debt, offshore dollar debt, um, I think that's concerning and we should monitor that. But we have to keep two things in mind. One, of course, some of these corporations have revenue in dollars, so they're hedged that way. So keep that in mind. And secondly, um, if you are a bank or a corporation there who need emergency dollars, you can get it ultimately indirectly from the Fed swap lines. So that helps a lot as well. Now, you have to understand the official sector, and they're not very smart, but but they can learn and they see that in the past, this blew up the system. So they, they want to make sure that the system doesn't blow up. So they're doing things to try to make sure that it doesn't blow up. And so far, it's been working, right? I honestly, if you asked me a year ago, would 4.5%, 4% Fed funds rate, would it break the system? And that's what's priced in going forward. I think it would. But so far, we have the 10-year going above four. We have the two-year going above four and a, four and a half. And so far, things are holding together. And I think part of the reason is because we have uh, so many things set up to protect that. Now, now going back to the S&B's soft lines. So there are two stories about why this. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, the S&B is drawing down on the Fed's FX soft lines. What that means is that there are Swiss banks that are going to the S&B to borrow dollars. And what the Swiss National Bank does is that it turns around and it borrows dollars from the Fed's swap lines and passes them on to their own banks. That's how the swap line money flows. Now, the S and B has been, you know, drawing down. I think maybe ten billion this week, or an increasing amount of money, yeah. and that means that their banks are borrowing money. Now, one story is that well, maybe their banks have distress. Maybe they have fund dollar funding needs, and so that's why this is a sign of concern. Uh, there's another story to this as well, and one that I believe in, and that is that this is just uh, this is just an arbitrage opportunity that some of the banks do. Now, this was first written about by in 2020 when this happened uh, by Zoltan Pozar, who is one of the preeminent strategists on Wall Street, who also works at a Swiss bank. So I have to assume that he's connected to the Swiss banking community. And he probably, and, he probably sees he probably sees the the, the payments go through. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's I, he sees more than more than I do for sure. Oh, yeah. um, so this is how the art works. So the Swiss National Bank, if you put money on deposit at the Swiss National Bank, you get interest on 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 your uh, your deposits. So what a what a small or medium sized Swiss National a Swiss commercial bank would do, it would borrow dollars uh, from the swap lines, okay? And it would take those dollars and swap them for Swiss francs. It would earn 
a funding yeah. premium for this, right? Because we're right now, um, we're, we're approaching year end. And in the fourth quarter, there's usually a premium for dollar funding. So it earns that premium. And then it takes the Swiss francs that it gets and it deposits them at the Swiss National Bank and earns interest on them. And this trade can be profitable depending on, uh, well, how much you're earning on the Swiss National Bank because they have tier depositing. Yeah, tier. And so, yeah, so this could be profitable for some of the medium to smaller banks and that's just what they could be doing. And apparently they do, they've done this in the past. And if that's all they're doing, you know, that's mm. not concerning. It's just some banks, you know, making a little bit of extra it, cash. It, it is a bit funny though, because since we, we, we heard and we saw about those uh, swap lines um, getting increasingly used in Switzerland, the dollar Swiss actually um, rallied. Oh, I know all the dollars rallied, but yes. um, I'm, I'm saying that the dollar Swiss rallied because the Swiss weakened also um, about a percent or percent and a half versus other currencies like the euro, for instance. Euro Swiss is, is trading a percent and a half higher or so than, than when then when we started to hear about those swap lines, so there must be some sort of an impact. And yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's why I, I was also wanting to, to pick your brain on this. Um, but I think you already uh, replied in parts, uh, at least because of the, the, the end of the year and the turn. And you, you rightfully say that seasonally, there's the, the funding cost for the dollar is, is going up. Yes. Is there? Is there a, a chance or a risk of a dollar shortage going into the turn, according to you? No, I don't think so. So the reason is because oh, the Fed is there willing to let unlimited amounts basically through the FX swap lines. Mm. If you have the Fed standing there, they're, they're putting kind of a soft ceiling on as to dollar funding. Yeah. You, if you want dollars, you can get it. Infinite amounts just have to borrow from the Fed. Now, maybe it'll be a little bit more expensive or maybe it won't be depending on where the market is trading. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really hard for me to, okay, to see any any funding problems in, in the uh, in the, right. in the markets. So uh, so for your audience, I would actually make sure that to, to understand there's a difference between the spot dollar and the dollar funding markets. Mm -hmm. If you want dollars, you don't actually go to the spot market. That's not how you go. That's how you go if you want to go broke. What you want to do is you go and you borrow money in the dollar funding markets, the FX swap markets in particular, or you can go to a bank. So if you have dollar funding needs that manifest itself in a wider FX swap basis, the extra money you have to pay to get a dollar loan. And that is what the Fed FX swap lines uh, put a soft ceiling on. And you know they're, they're willing to do that in size. So, so it's very unlikely to me that that would, that would be a problem. And just to be more concrete with this, this example, if you remember, if you recall in um, 2020, tremendous, tremendous demand for dollar funding, the FX swap basis was just exploding, exploding wider. And then the Fed FX, the Fed opened up its FX swap lines and that premium shrank. It just disappeared. And the foreign central banks, they drew down, I think, close to $500 billion on the FX swap lines. So that's all money that the Fed lent to the global international community. And they're still doing that. They're still opening up swap lines to people. So, you know, it, it works. If there's fallen needs, they're just, they'll just get it from the Fed. Do they lend those dollars at um, <clears throat> at current short end rates, or do do they have like a fixed uh, interest rate yeah. facility with, uh, with 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 other people? Like because I mean I can understand that you want to borrow an, a gigantic amount of dollars when interest rates are uh, are at close to zero, uh, and yeah. and and we must say in twenty twenty there was a risk. People were afraid uh, everywhere around the globe. <clears throat> that the economy, the global economy, would, would completely implode. So you want as much as much liquidity as you can to to pump out of the, out of the system, just in case. Um, but then they were borrowing those those via those swap lines at virtually zero. Now they are borrowing via those swap lines at rates that we see right now, right? Yeah. So the swap lines are priced off of OIS, so it's like a fixed spread to OIS. Yeah. So it, it's it's X. The point of it is to basically put a soft ceiling on, on market rates. They, they don't want the basis to widen past a certain level. Um, mm -hmm. Some people might think that there might be some six stick stigma to borrowing from this. I, I, I think it really depends, though. Obviously, it's not a stigma in, um, in Switzerland. 
I've heard that there is a little bit of stigma in Japan, so maybe that there's more reluctance to use that there. But I think it really depends on your region as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, it should mean, be in, in, in Japan. The yes. situation is is perhaps slightly different than uh, than anywhere else, right? Um, because of their their specific situation, right, o over there. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of a lot of uh, dollar borrowing, a lot of investment in dollars uh, over there, and that's also one of the reasons why we have seen this sharp acceleration in the dollar yen. Not only because of Bank of Japan versus the the, the Fed, but uh, for other reasons, uh, reasons as well. Besides, of course, they're they're having to pay uh, a gigantic amount for their uh, for their imports as well, right? Um, so, do you have any? Um, because we are. There we. What have we got left? Five minutes or so. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we talk about trades. What 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 are you looking at um, going like in the next couple of months, or what what is your main focus right uh, right now? Good question. So my so I look at the world through the lens of policy, uh, you know, central bank policy, which I believe is the largest driver in asset prices, and also from what I understand of the financial system. Now, as I as I discussed earlier with Dale, I I see that the ten year going above four percent is pulling up global yields, and that is causing some very serious financial stability concerns. You had something break in the UK. It's never just one thing. All the, yeah. there's a whole bunch of people holding a lot of sovereign debt, some of it in with leverage. That is fragility, and I think a lot of people are getting tested right now. Now, that the, the so. The question is where it would break and what would happen when it broke. Uh, my view is that eventually something will break, but it's not going to be in the US. It's probably going to be in the Eurozone. Um, if you look at a chart of, let's say, US banks against European banks, you'll see that the US financial system, uh, the US banks have basically zoomed past their, uh, their pre crisis levels. They're doing very well. Mm. A lot of European banks. You know, they, they're just gone nowhere for decades. So, uh, the DB looks like it's going to die any day. <laughs> so so the financial system in the U.S. is much stronger than it is um, than outside of the U.S. So as uh, longer data yields go higher, I think of it as basically sucking money out of the financial system since you're having losses on very important assets, your sovereign debt at portfolio. Eventually, it's something will crack, I think, in the Eurozone or maybe in the UK more or something like that. That will force the policymakers over there to step in and try to put a floor on the prices of their sovereign debt. So, for example, you already see the ECB freaking out when there's when the spread between buns and uh, BTPs just widens past 200 basis. That's mm. that's actually historically not that wide, right? So you, they're they're very concerned about this. Now it's not just about the spread, though. I think it's also about the level. Now, when the ECB, if you have the 10-year and Treasury is going to four and a half percent, if you have the ECB stepping back, I, I have to see that I have to think that the BTPs and the Spanish sovereign debt. Are going to go up as well. That's, I think the ECB is going to have to step in, just kind of put some ceiling to to some of their debt over there in the eurozone. And here's the thing here, and, and here's how the, this affects the markets. If the Fed can continue to let treasuries go higher, if the Fed can continue to hike, but everyone else is is being limited by the fragility of their financial system, that means the interest rate differentials will widen, and mm. I, I expect that to. But its tailwinds so will further strengthen the dollar. So my myself, I'm long the dollar against the euro, uh, and against gilts. And I, I think that we have you know several hundred bips to go. Mm. Um, that's one thing, and that also has I think another aspect to this as well. If you have foreign central banks stepping into their bond market like the like the Bank of England and putting a soft ceiling on yields, and that's just it's not just dollars. It's not just dollar positive, it's also risk positive because you're cutting off tail risks as well. And if you put a ceiling on rates in uh, uh, sovereign rates in abroad that bleeds into sovereign rates in the US, you see more stability in the US Treasury market. More stability, I think, also takes away tail, tail risk and is more pos risk positive. So, I, I, so my own view is I think risk assets actually do well this fourth this fourth quarter. I with think we a, see with it. a stronger dollar in in units. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because another That's way to think about this, and this is really important. 
I think oftentimes U.S. investors are too U.S. Cent- centered, so U.S. focused. If, for example, you are, let's say, you are if you are a Japanese investor and you bought the S and P this year, okay. In the U.S., we're like, oh my God, this is terrible. S and P is going down twenty five percent. But if you're a Japanese investor, yeah, the S and P goes down twenty five percent, but my currency depreciated like you know thirty percent. I'm doing okay. This is a good trade. I'm making, I'm losing on the S and P, but I'm making money on the currency side of it. And this is this is going to be the same view by. <laughs> this is going to be the same view by a lot of investors in the eurozone, in the UK, in the. Uh, you know Japan, so for them the U.S. looks like a good place. You could have a lot of foreign capital inflows supporting the U.S. asset markets as well. Um, they're from their perspective, their losses being covered by their dollar exposure. Yeah, wow, what a great I have, I would have loved to disagree so we could have a real discussion, but I'm I'm on your side really as the people. Are, no, I, but you know, I, I, I feel I, more I confident can't be, now. I'm I half on your it. side, Joseph. I'm, I'm half. I cannot. I cannot be dollar bearish for for more than a few sessions. Uh, I, I mean, for the for the time being, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm completely on your side because it's a it's a case of quality, um, and and you add uh, you add on the, the the interest rate differential right now. Yes, there are some tail uh, some some tail risks um, uh, have now been been diminished because the um, the uh, let's say for en- for energy, for instance, is uh, is the, the prices are coming off in uh, in in Europe, um, but against that, you still have like uh, Germany putting in a two hundred billion euro program because they have to save um, their economy and their uh, and their inhabitants basically from uh, from going bankrupt uh, just to pay higher higher prices. So I I, I completely agree uh, with you and. Uh, um, yeah, I've been saying it for for a long while as well. I, I'm, I still like, and um, maybe a little bit divergent there because you were talking about uh, liquidity issues, in Mexico and stuff. I still think Mexico is a pretty decent place to be um, for uh, at least for forex forex trader and and carry for a carry trade. Or a night in Tijuana came okay, man. You have to try it. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I. I... Hey, I'm on the sunny. I'm on this. I'm I'm on the sunny southwestern UK coast, man. You, I mean, you can't beat. Right. <laughs> Joseph's the been sun to in the UK. <laughs> no, I've not been to Tiana. I'm surprised right. to hear the sun in the UK, though. So, <laughs> right. okay. Well, listen, uh, anyway, uh, I mean, thanks, thanks very much, Joseph. Uh, um, it was really, really, really great to talk to you, and uh, we should do it again very, very soon. And pass it back. Absolutely, over to you. Thanks, it's a pleasure Dale. speaking with you guys. Thanks, and uh, Joseph, uh, here's where you could find him at fedguy.com mm-hmm. and on Twitter, fedguy12. Uh, Joseph, thanks for your giving and gentle spirit educating us about things that most of us don't understand. And thank you for giving this summit clarity on the Fed today. My pleasure, guys. Take care. Thank you so All much. Right.